as I said, the first team to present will be the team B and B. You can start sharing your screen, guys. And then second presenting team will be the team MetaHack. And first, we will go through the challenge of variance pathogenicity. And first four teams presenting will be the teams from this challenge. So first team to present is BNB. And if you guys can uh, start the screen sharing right now, you are doing it already. Hey, That's hey, really hi. great. Yeah. Okay. Yes. And uh, so I will set up a timer. Uh, just one second. I have it ready. So maybe oh, you we're have gonna it ready. start. Yes. Okay. So guys, the floor is yours for a minute starting now. Okay. Uh, hi everyone, so I represent the BNB team, which is a team of three students in bioinformatics and biostatistics. Um, we have been working on a variant pathogenicity model, uh, prediction, sorry. So how we try to make a good prediction model. And I will present here what we have done to uh, attempt. And uh, first of all, we uh, try to understand the variables um, to understand their possible uh, impact on the prediction model and eventually remove some of the, uh, of the variable. And uh, secondly, we find that uh, um, the distribution of missing values by variables uh, is very high uh, in uh, some variable. So subsequently, it was necessary to manage uh, these missing values. And the first option uh, was removing all the variants that had least uh, one, uh, one of missing value or more. But this approach is uh, considerably reducing the number of variants uh, available for the model. And we go ahead and for the second option, that was to uh, replace the missing value of a variable with the mean for a uh, numerical variable or the most uh, frequent value uh, for categorical variable. And um, then it was done. So we, um, we encoded the categorical variable uh, using label encoder from scikit-learn on Python. And uh, once, uh, once the data set had no missing values, we implemented the leave one group out cross validation method. So with the protein variable as a group. And uh, finally, we tested several crossification model and sometime we uh, removed some variables to potentially get uh, a better prediction score and a, a better IUC uh, value. And I will just show you one uh, rock curve. So, uh, here you can see the best rock curve we got. Um, the model present here was based on a quadratic discriminant analysis and it has been trained on all variable uh, except for the allele current variable which simply reflects the allelic frequency so we just remove this. And um, for all the models we created we had uh, an AC value greater than 70% and a prediction score approximately equal to 90%. So we found that this was great, but uh, even if these models can look interesting, we should not forget that all our missing value uh, have been replaced and a better management of uh, missing values will be preferable. One minute um, left. Okay. And in addition, more variables could potentially improve uh, the model and also more variants per protein could, poten could potentially improve the models. Uh, so here I come. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you a lot. Now, Emily, if you have a questions, please, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot. That's very nice. That looked like a really impressive performance. Can you, what do you think? Why does this model work so well and the others don't? Um, why this model works well? Um, I don't know. Uh, it works well because we just use the train set um, and the validation set on Benin and pathogenicity set. So is that great? Yeah, thanks. Thank you a lot.
for your presentation. Now we are going to the next presenters. Uh, the next team presenting is the team MetaHack. So team BNB, please stop the screen share and team MetaHack, please start the screen share. And the next team to present will be the team trackers. So please prepare team trackers and uh, now presenting team MetaHack. We can see your screen. Uh, are you guys ready to start? Team MetaHack, are you ready? We cannot listen to you guys. Yes, can you listen to me now? Now we can hear you, Anil, loud and clear, uh, but we cannot see your screen anymore, so you'll have to restart. Can you see now? Yes. And now we can see and hear, and it's brilliant. And are you ready? Yes. Let's go. Time starts now. So I am Anil Kondal, and I represent team MetaHack, and we have done machine learning prediction for variant pathogenicity prediction. So this is the flow chart in which to show our method. First, we have data, clean data by removing all the uh, variables with not available values, not all exactly. We have only kept those variables in, remove only those variables in which uh, values were not available for um, fold X and covert 2D. And then we have done some feature extraction for amino acids in which wild type amino acid and new mutated amino acid and finally for modeling we have used two machine learning methods logistic regression and svm and lastly we have compared them with the base method in which only variables used for training were um, foldex and cover so for model training data was divided into two set training and validation set. In training set, uh, data was trained using trained in K, using five fold stratification uh, in which uh, they were trained iteratively for a few, uh, for five times by leaving one set each time. And then finally, uh, for hyperparameter tuning, we have used caution process method and after model selection, we have test, tested it on a validation set for, and, and, and while data exploration, we observe that uh, if you observe the second column, which represents covert 2D and the below row represent pathogenic and above represents Bannigan, you, uh, you can observe that uh, for Bannigan, the cover curves is like exponentially with starting from uh, left side and falling down. Whereas in pathogenic, the opposite is true. And based on our knowledge that aerolic frequency is very low among pathogenic and we have, and, and, and using the um, information from histogram, we plotted it in this scatter plot. And we hypothesize that uh, since most of the re research focuses on proteins involved in a, a diseases if more uh, if more abenigan uh, mutations are included then we will see a lot of u plots uh, on the left side of the on the sorry on the right side of the line and for feature extraction we have used only six co columns which are uh, wild type amino acid foldex and one minute okay, and we have done one. So let me just show you the accuracy. So this is the base accuracy in which, and then custom accuracy for SVC and logistic regression. As you can see, there has been some improvement in both the cases. And this is the ROC curve from SVC base method and SVC by using our own features. Similar. This is for logistic regression. Here, the our model performs better than again. And more, we observe that the, the the data is actually very skewed. There were actually 910 pathogenic rows and only 133 Bennigan rows. So, if more data is collected about Bennigan variants, then it would help uh, our uh, model training and a more spare robust metric for assessment is 
is required. Time, last sentence. Hmm? Time, you're done? Okay, yes, I'm done. Okay, thank you so much for your presentation. Really cool. Uh, Emily, now it's your turn. You would like to ask some questions? Thanks, very nice. I'm glad that you look at the data in detail. And indeed, you're right that there is a big imbalance between pathogenic and benign. That's historical. It's not really something I could or anybody can easily do anything about. Have you considered maybe in your training or validation to introduce subsampling so that you could, you know, counteract this bias? Uh, we actually thought about it, but due to time constraint, I couldn't apply the result. I couldn't experiment it. That makes perfect sense. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank you a lot. And we keep moving further. You can stop sharing your screen. Now the next team coming is a team trackers. Uh, team trackers presenting. Please prepare team modern synthesis. Modern synthesis. I'm sorry. Okay. Team trackers, we can see your screen. Can you say something? Okay. Um, I'm here, Marion. Hi, we can hear you. Uh, are you ready to start? Oh, yes. Oh, sorry. It's not in the first slide. Oh, here. Uh, well, uh, my name is Marion. Uh, I represent a team from Brazil. Uh, we are bioinformaticians, uh, Brazilian informaticians. We are working on the challenge variant, variant pathogenicity uh, prediction. Uh, our team is composed by Camila, Gregorio, me, Monique, and Selma. Um, our goals were mainly to predict the, the pathogenic variants uh, from the related to Lynch syndrome. Uh, we had a, a lot of difficulty with lack of structural data, a lot of NAs, uh, information on structural, structural energy data, and a lot of uh, da unbalanced, unbalanced data uh, in our data, data set as uh, told by uh, the other teams uh, and uh, to manage that uh, we decided initially to use only one algorithm uh, uh, we chose MLP uh, and then we kept all target classes not only the pathogenic and, benef and the um, uh, benignant ones but all of them to, to evaluate the results. Uh, we used MATLAB to develop our uh, scripts and uh, we decided to use five fold cross validation in these uh, evaluations. Uh, I'll just discuss uh, with the results uh, with you the um, sorry, <laughs> I'll discuss with you the, the results. Then we performed in the data processing to solve the problem of NAs. We decided to use uh, MLP to predict the values, uh, the missing values, so we predicted them uh, using MLP. Those are the graphs we had from for the predictions. Uh, then uh, we compared them to the uh, to the set without the, the the rows with NAs, and we had some gain of performance uh, for the classes um, for benign and pathogen. Uh, classes which were our targets, but we lost a little bit of performance in the one in the 10,000 values. Uh, but uh, we decided to move on with those uh, predicted values to manage the NAs and to be able to move on to the next analysis. So uh, we decided to make some uh, management with the unbalanced data. We just uh, separated. Uh, we just tried a lot of uh, approaches such as normalization. We didn't improve much the results. And then uh, we separated some proteins, the, 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 more, the ones with more data, such as like BRCA2 or the ones related to uh, colon cancer to evaluate if the results would be better. We had some improvement, One but minute it, it, it wasn't that, that significant in our results. As we can see in the plots here, uh, we have um, loss of uh, predictions in a pathogenic class for BRA, BRCA in column results. And we finally are showing here just, uh, we decided to remove the common variants. It was just 26 lines 
from our data to just improve our accuracy and other results, but in the end of uh, it doesn't change the lot of our accuracy it was good more than 90% with all this data set. And uh, we finally uh, showing just here the results. Uh, we have a good results for uh, recall also in BRCA, which may suggest uh, the prediction of false positives in, in the data set. So it may be caused due to the unbalanced data. We just uh, didn't banish the unbalanced data. So uh, we have some uh, quality, uh, some good results in, in our predictions, but we need to explore further the biological aspects of it to, to make Time. better predictions. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Emily, your turn. Thanks a lot. You show this drop in performance for the one in 10,000 set. Do you have any idea why that would be? Uh, it, it may be possible uh, due to the um, lack of values we have on it. it I think it's the second, uh, it's the smallest set we have, but I think it's the second smallest uh, set. But uh, we believe that maybe the, re the reason may be we don't have much of a pattern in this data because this one to 10,000, I, as I understood, it's related to uh, some uh, general uh, some rare occasions in the and when they can predict this variant has some effect so uh, it may be due to not having a pattern in the data that's that's the conclusion we got thanks that's very interesting it's not something I've observed but it's possible thanks thank you that's a great conclusion thank you so much and we're going to the next team uh, next presenting is a team model synthesis please start uh, sharing your screen and the next three teams presenting afterwards will be the teams from the FOX03 challenge. Uh, the first, uh, please prepare team VAR finders. Okay, can you see my screen? We can see your screen and we can hear you. We're ready to start. Okay, hi. We are the modern synthesists. Um, wait a second. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we um, took a look at the uh, pathogenicity uh, detection. Um, problem. We tried different things. Mm, at one time we tried uh, um, SVMs, we tried linear regression, and but our final model builds on uh, a two-layer uh, neural network, uh, which we coded with Keras. Um, yeah, we at first we just used the FoldXDDG data, uh, uh, the uh, fold CDG and the cover 2 p and the allele frequencies as parameters. Uh, and later we added uh, the Grantham amino acid distances and Blossom 62 scores for the uh, amino acid substitutions that were generated by the missense mutations in the data set. Um, but because um, of the missing values, we had to drop a lot of them out. And in the end, we only had like 1,700 or 1,800 roundabout left. Um, yeah, uh, one of, one uh, one of 10,000 in common variants um, um, classified variants were also used. We didn't include the GNOME AD data because we couldn't really um, classify them as either pathogenic or non-pathogenic and even after researching we didn't really find information on that. Um, some missing fold XDDG and cover 2 d values were also generated randomly from the existing distribution of, uh, of the data because we didn't really want to just just put random values um, in um, yeah, we, we tried doing it based on the um, distributions of the existing data. Yeah, um, in the end, uh, here you can see two uh, ROC curves and a with the AOC values for two genes. One uh, where it worked uh, relatively good and one where it didn't work that great. Um, yeah. Uh, Okay, yeah, um, uh, future perspectives, like in general, more data is needed to build models with higher accuracy, accuracy and generalizability. 
Like um, if you have 1,700 data points, that's not bad, but like at uh, 100,000 data points, you have a model that is like um, robust enough that you can be relatively sure that new, um, uh, new, um, new data points can be predicted with a high accuracy and uh, it won't be easily fooled by uh, data I mean, and that is a robust model. So uh, the improvements that we have uh, or that we could think of in general were enhancing the data set by uh, increasing the amount of data, uh, incorporating mo multiple methods together from an accurate prediction, which is also what um, uh, our mentor um, presented to us as an option in the beginning, and uh, partitioning the data set and training models independently based on different gene families, because um, in some genes it might be very important that the overall um, protein stability is um, um, is not impaired, but in other proteins, it's maybe not that uh, important. Time? Or, yeah. If we can stop here. Then Emily, the floor is yours for the questions. Great, thanks so much. You showed performance for two different proteins and how it can really be rather, well, one great and one not so great, which is a very important observation. What do you think? Why is it so poor for ADSL? Um, I don't have the pathogenicity values uh, in mind right now, but we checked every time how many uh, uh, values uh, or what proportion is pathogenic and which is not. And um, our model tended to just always predict something is pathogenic because of the fact as um, um, the other compet competitors already pointed out that there are always more pathogenic values. So a model would simply perform well if, um, uh, if the test uh, data uh, would also have a lot of pathogenic data. So VHL maybe has a lot of um, pathogenic uh, variants while ADSL probably has more benign variants. And that's why you see such a difference in performance there. That would certainly be a possibility. I can tell you that I've seen, even when correcting for that, I still see the same problem. And I think it's that all the data we're currently using is just not informative for this particular protein. Yeah, but it's yeah. a very good point that you raised. Yeah. Cool. I think that yeah. Great. I think that this for a really good discussion. And now we're done. Uh, with your presentations. Next team presenting, please share your screen team bar finders. Please prepare team nocturnal animals. Okay, hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, so. But we cannot see your screen yet. Yeah, no. And no, what does it look like? It looks like it's about to appear. Is it working well? It's black. It says it, you just started the screen, sir. Now it is. Yes, we can see you and hear you now. And your time starts now. Yes, please Super. go. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Uh, are you all all right? We are the VAR finders uh, working for the FOX03 variants. Um, so here we are, the FOX Edbox O is a group of transcription factors regulating development, metabolism, and aging. Uh, four members, FOX01, FOX03, FOX04, FOX06, share the same FOX Ed uh, element. It's widely used in senolytics research, um, with notably the FOX04 DRI uh, developed by the Clara Tech and the epigenetics clock. Uh, now we study the FOX03 with um, we, uh, that upregulating the the SOD2 to protect the cells from DNA damages. So it's really important um, in longevity. Uh, it has been shown that uh, knocking the gen FOX03 uh, induced senescence in human dermal fibroblast uh, and uh, some research arrived to the conclusion that maybe FOXO3 and some of these single nucleotide variants 
can be linked to cardiovascular disease. So our aim is to, to know um, if it's right. So our group, the Varfinders, uh, Suet Ali, who is working in drug delivery uh, research, Nicola Feldman, who is a PhD student in, um, with a molecular background, uh, Nishat, who started a master study in biochemical engineering, uh, Yazonas, who just completed his master studying in computer science and is really interesting into bioinformatics, and myself. Um, so um, uh, our goal is it was to find uh, Fox O3 variant in cardiovascular diseases. For that, uh, our roadmap was to extract data from the gene atlas, uh, all the threats related to CVD, then to pass clean and identify the Fox O3 variants, and then to present our research using an interactive heat map. So we opened the gen gene atlas related to CVD disease, uh, focused on the Fox O3 variant, which is located in the chromosome six from the band uh, 108,000 KB to 109,000 KB. We find 56 traits related to CVD and 1,215 variants. Then we build our database from that. One minute left. Oh, second point, we search for the NCB, uh, which one was all the variants, so 28,000 variants, and we decide to pass the data to find only 257 candidates. And then we create the heat map. So in the heat map, we uh, choose the positive control uh, from each threat using the lowest p-value of each threat and the negative control uh, from 0 0.8 to point, uh, the p-value of 0 0.8 to 1. And then uh, we find that couple like subsequent myocard infraction can be associated with variants such as R RS19, uh, et cetera. Uh, so they can be considered. So they, we have a value to study this heat map. And also this heat map can show the interaction between uh, Lincoln S and P. So, uh, for further work, we can study the interaction. Uh, all our code and the database are left, available. Last sentence, please. Okay, uh, going further, uh, we can go further by studying other Fox O group member and other phenotypes and uh, uh, create Manhattan map. That's it. Time. Uh, thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you very much. Uh, Victor, the floor is yours for a question. Thank you very much, Jules, for the presentation and thanks to Barfinders for that amazing work. That was fantastic. Uh, I do have one quick question, though. Yeah. Um, do you think that could could you come up with a hypothesis? Why do you think that there have been um, studies showing FOXO associated with the protection of cardiovascular disease, but you guys couldn't find any um, relationship with the induction or the susceptibility of cardiovascular disease? Uh, so, first of all, it was an, a suggestion about cardiovascular disease. So uh, eventually, like there is no direct link between FOXO3 and cardiovascular disease. Maybe there was also more direct linked. Uh, also, as I said previously, maybe uh, it can be. Um, uh, how can I how can I say that? It can be a cluster. It can be a cluster of variants that work together to to change the, um, uh, to make the Zeus disease. Um, but yeah, 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 and also maybe we didn't find all the variants. Maybe they, they are located in another chromosome. But that is that is absolutely correct, Jules. I mean, uh, it is worth having a look at, uh, or it's very naive to expect that only one variant will contribute uh, to uh, such a complex disease as cardiovascular. Yeah, and we still like maybe. Yeah, and that's a great explanation, and we have to go further, unfortunately. And I think we can continue discussions in the okay. slide afterwards. Thanks. Now, thank you for the streaming. Please, next team presenting is Nocturnal Animals. Please share your screen. And the team, uh, how I met my genome, please prepare. Uh, also, if uh, I would like to tell while we are getting ready, everybody else are invited to turn on your cameras so that we guys can have a bit more social interaction and see each other faces. Uh, in a gallery view, which you can turn on in a Zoom using a button on top right or pressing Alt F2. Uh, or also the speaker, please, if it's okay with you, speaker, please always turn on your cameras so we can record you guys. Um, and uh, 
yeah, one additional note, I suggest that for the sake of speed, in the future, uh, during the question session, I will stop the screen share and uh, the next team should start the screen share so that we are ready to roll uh, with the next team already and we get, can do this technical work while we are uh, asking answering the questions. Uh, team Nocturno Animals, are you guys ready to go? Yeah, sure. Go ahead, your time starts now. Okay, thank you. Hello guys, uh, we are Team Nocturno Animals and we would like to present to you our results on what we find out whether fox gene variants associated with cardiovascular disease and more. So our plan was to select all the trades from the trade table, download data tables from the past results and uh, for this interval. And then we supposed to write a parser for it as it was too hard to download all the huge data sets. And uh, this parser allows us to download not only cardiovascular disease related traits, but all the traits uh, to uh, look into it uh, to see some additional correlations as well. So then we would like to uh, convert it to minus uh, log p value as usual and use plotly for heat maps and CM plot for circular Manhattan plots. And also we would like to investigate other variants of the gene. So first uh, we look uh, on gene structure and uh, some regulation patterns that may be useful during interpretation process. And uh, here is one of the results. It's a FOX heat map for some cardiovascular disease related traits. And as you can see, uh, the log p-value is not so good. Uh, so then we like to compare it with some uh, top uh, value for diseases. So as you can see, uh, the lime green uh, at the center is for FOX3 and uh, all the others is for another SNPs associated with the disease uh, top. Uh, so uh, this FOX is not so important, but we still believe that it's important through. So then we uh, go through other variants. Uh, we plot FOX1, FOX6, FOX one B, FOX three B, but uh, and see some results. For example, for FOX one, we can see some uh, data with uh, quite huge uh, log log p value, and uh, and it's quite good. Uh, but we can't uh, get the opportunity to dip into it, unfortunately. And uh, then we'd like to see some non-cardiovascular related, but as we believe, aging related traits. So as you can see, uh, there is the trait basal metabolic rate, which has huge p-value. And we believe uh, that this can be um, uh, correlated with some uh, lipid metabolism as well, because other traits that are shown here, unfortunately, is uh, based with uh, body mass rate and uh, body fat rate as well. One so, minute left. Uh, uh, things we wanted to do but haven't uh, done for time. We didn't have so much sleep. Uh, unfortunately, we don't do interpretation of our SNPs. Uh, we download some regulatory elements and would like to annotate, but don't have time. And the other idea was to study uh, transcription factor binding places and whether mutation at these sites can be also uh, important for uh, diseases. So if I have some time, I can try to... Um, you have 10 seconds, you can say one more sentence. Uh, 10 seconds, you can say one more sentence. Okay. Uh, uh, I just wanted to, uh, to, to share with you um, some interactive plots, if I have some time. I think we'll do it, uh, unfortunately, okay. in, just like, uh, out just of time, because like we're like out that. of time. Uh, oh. Sorry, it's, it's just <laughs> like that, you can see the log p value and the trait and the variance, so it can be useful to just look into it. You can zoom it and so on. So just, so nice. just like uh, Victor, you have time for a very short question. Yes, very short. First, thank you very much for that impressive work. Uh, that was very, very good, Nocturnal Animals. Uh, the one question that I have is, 
uh, do you think that these variants that you saw associated with metabolic rate could they all be uh, related uh, in one way or another? Again, this is just speculation. <laughs> Uh, I think uh, they can because uh, also we see some correlations, as I said, with some uh, fat metabolism, with some uh, body mass as well. So uh, it's uh, hard to interpret it right now, but uh, in general, it can uh, plot some picture how it can be work on aging in general, not on cardiovascular disease particular, but in general on aging. Wonderful. Thank you very much for the work. Great explanation. Uh, thank, you. thank you so much. Uh, and now we're going uh, further down the list. The next team presenting how I made my genome. Please share your screen. And after that, we will have three next teams presenting from the next challenge, protein origami. And the team to prepare is team biologicians. Presenting team how I made my genome. Are you guys ready? Um, yeah. Can you see my screen? We can see and hear you. The floor is yours. Okay, cool. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Kai and I'm from how I met my genome team. Well, um, so FOX3 variants is generally rec recognized as master gene aging. Um, they may have something to do with the cardiovascular disease, so we're not, but we're not so sure yet. So the challenge is to identify the FOX3 variants uh, and compare them with other variants. Right. Okay, but um, so a standard way of representing a GWAS is by using a Manhattan plot. So you can see the x-axis is the chromosome numbers and the y-axis um, is the transformed p-values. So if, um, so the higher the value um, of on the y-axis a genetic variant is, um, the more statistically um, associated that variant is with a trait and in this case is the acute myocardial infarction. Um, so for our challenge. Um, we extracted GWAS summary statistics data from the gene access database and we organize our variants in three ways, in three conditions. The first one we call it the FOXO3 condition, where we select the variants um, for the three cardiovascular disease traits, which are acute myocardial infarction, angina pectoris, and also atherosclerosis. Um, then we have the positive controls, which are the top variants um, for each of these three traits, and also the negative controls, which are the ATF2 variants. Um, the ATF2 is a gene, a housekeeping gene in chromosome 2 region, similarly for these three traits. Um, so firstly, we try to visualize the data in a more kind of traditional Manhattan plot way, where the axis is the chromosomes and the y-axis is the negative, um, the transform p-values. Um, and you can see that FOX3 variants are in a um, six chromosome, negative control in the second chromosome, um, seems like they're not behaving very differently uh, with each other, whereas the positive control variants are all kind of above the significance threshold. And this is kind of like an enlarged version comparing between FOX03 and negative control. And we see the similar patterns for acute myocardial infarction, atherosclerosis, and also for engineer pectoris. Um, and then we thought, why not we try to change the accesses to something else, maybe the conditions. Um, so this is just another way of representing it um, with box plot and um, the distribution of p-values. And you can see, again, um, the positive controls and the box tree variants are not behaving very differently. Um, but we don't want to just stop there. Um, so we figure out a way to, to plot the Manhattan plot in a 3D way. Um, and we were kind of using codes from a tool called Big Top and we tried to sort of modify it. So here is a video that shows um, how it's like. So, in, so we can see on the walls, these are the conditions. Um, and then you can see there are like dots hanging in the air. One minute. As is that basically walk into a room of Manhattan plot. Um, and most of the variants which are hanging in the air are those coming from the positive controls because they're really significant. Whereas those on the floor, as you can see, there are some dots in the floor. They are all the variants coming from the FOXO3 condition and also the um, negative control. Um, I'll leave this video going um, while we talk about conclusions. So um, we think that there isn't very much association between um, the FOXO3 variants with the three cardiovascular disease traits. So for future direction, maybe we're we'll going to in or um, look into more traits and also, of course, to um, make this visualization much better. Thank you.
Thank you. You are on time. It's, it's brilliant. Victor, you have time for a question. Hi, thank you very much for the work and thank you very much for the work to the team. Uh, I think this, I applaud the effort that you guys have made uh, creating those uh, different forms of visualization and I'm very, very intrigued about this new one, this last one. Do you see any other applications uh, for this potential of visualization for other biological relevant data? Um, yeah, I guess um, this it, it adds in a more, like one more dimension, which is the minor allele frequency on the third axis. So um, um, when we're discussing about, you know, when about this yesterday, you mentioned about common variants and rare variants. So maybe this axis can, can act kind of like a check versus to see the allele frequency. Very nice. Yeah. Thank you a lot. Uh, we're going further now. Uh, the next team presenting is team biologicians. Please prepare team if you be quick and break. Uh, and the uh, speakers, please remember to join on your cameras on. And again, everybody else, you're also welcome to join your cameras on. We can see you in a gallery view. And it's always nice to see uh, more uh, happy and excited faces. Uh, team, uh, the biologicians, we can see your screen. Uh, can you say something? Hello, um, I think you are seeing the wrong screen. All right, one second. We used to see the presentation. Right now, I see the presentation called Team Biologicians, Protein, Origami, and Donates. Is that the screen you want us okay. to see? Yes. So, uh, we are a team of four bioinformaticians based in Copenhagen. And we are moving now on to uh, a new challenge, uh, the Protein Structure Prediction Challenge. Uh, it's been called the Holy Grail of Bioinformatics. So, classical problem of uh, predicting the 3D structure from a, a one dimensional amino acid sequence of a protein. And um, we are um, approaching this with, uh, yeah, based on the open protein data um, uh, GitHub. And our uh, first approach was to uh, incorporate half sphere exposure as an, uh, a new measure, well, as an additional measure for, um, for training. And um, so the half sphere exposure is the number of uh, C alpha atoms, so uh, backbone uh, C atoms that are in uh, the half sphere um, surrounding a, a given atom, C atom, and um, we think that, well, we know that there uh, is an, um, a limited amount of, um, or an expected amount of C atoms that can be in this sphere, so uh, we use this as a, a measure between the, uh, to compute a, an additional um, difference measure between the predicted um, and the tr true structure. And so um, that is the first approach. The other approach is to, instead of um, training with that on, uh, doing the training of the machine learning algorithm uh, it, to basically use this measure as a regularization term so that we uh, avoid overfitting and so uh, we compute uh, statistically what is an expected uh, house fee exposure in um, in that case. Um, the pro problem with this approach was though that it's very uh, slow to compute and uh, it gave us uh, uh, for each one time like one minute um, for each uh, sorry batch, one minute waiting uh, time runtime, so uh, it, we we couldn't uh, get results based on this approach. Um, we also um, changed the embedding or from one hot encoding to um, an uh, an encoding of the amino acids based on their Blossom sixty two matrix, so um, describing the similarity to other amino acids and. Um, here there were some uh, bugs in the code, uh, so that did not work out. So we went to um, go to a, th a third approach, which is to change the model. And uh, here several things have been tr tried in uh, um, open protein. Uh, what One minute left. Uh, CNNs, so we uh, built a little structure for that. And um, that gave us um, some, uh, Structures which were too crumbled up sometimes, and sometimes they were uh, they were uh, straight elongated. So um, here certainly there is uh, there is a conceptual mistake in the CNNs. Um, so for the coronavirus protein structure that we uh, were evaluated on, um, it gave us a kind of a spaghetti structure, which is definitely not what we <laughs> see. 
So um, we learned here that um, we have to reorganize better for our next uh, project and uh, work towards a mineral working product before uh, throwing all these fancy ideas into the mix and uh, having to try to make everything work because that didn't work out. Um, thank you for listening. Great guys, you're also on time and this is brilliant. Uh, now uh, we can have one question. Sure, uh, very cool uh, ideas you tried out. Uh, especially like the first one, the half sphere one, I think that's very interesting to consider sort of nearby uh, amino acids because uh, obviously that's how it works in, in physics. Uh, that said, you, it seems that you only sort of uh, uh, actually consider nearby uh, amino acids. So can you think of any way to basically speed up the, the, the process of computing this number given that you only really care about the near, nearby amino acids? Yeah, I guess we could uh, look at the amino acids next to the sequence in a sequence window and just compute those. Yeah, but then we would lose a lot of information that like actually makes that attractive to use in first place because um, yeah, that would give us the possibility to like select um, or like see amino acids that are also very far away, but from the stereo hair, uh, very close um, because proteins can fold and like sometimes the end of the sequence can be just like in the third space very close to beginning of a sequence, but that would, from the, like, just the sequence, it would be not very close. So, yeah, like, um, I think then the, there would be other approaches that would be more suited, but yeah. Cool, yeah, that makes sense. Thank you a lot for discussion for the answer. Uh, next team presenting is team If You Ubiquitin Break. Please share your screen and uh, prepare, please prepare team V proteins. We can see a screen as a PDF file open, and I think we can hear a mouse click. So I guess we can hear you. Can you say something? Uh, okay. Do you hear me? Yes. Yes, we do. Okay. Uh, so, you ready to start? Yes. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, so first of all, thanks for having us. Uh, we are a group of students from Barcelona studying uh, in a Master of Bioinformatics, <clears throat> and we took on the challenge of the protein origami. So let's move on. Uh, so um, first of all, uh, just some words about the problem. Okay, the challenge was to rewrite or modify the folding algorithms and find new and original ways of producing the tertiary structures. And the question we um, we asked ourselves was, how can we optimize the neural network in order to um, uh, to tackle this challenge? So the approach was to rely on the two uh, layer neural network that was provided by the open open protein library and try to tweak it and and add some additional information especially uh relating the um, related to the to the angles of rotation and the drmsd into the neural network to uh sort of um improve the um, both computation and uh the the modeling so uh we went over and, and, and did that so the way we did that um was both to include the computation of the, the angles in the, um, in the neural network, in the two layers of the neural network, and uh, the DRMST. And then we went over and tweaked um, the loss function so we would take into account both, both pieces of information. Um, we wanted to show this because we, um, we basically took two approaches of this. So at first, our results, like at first we would, uh, we went over and Kind of plotted a control case in which we would just use the two layers um, neural network with uh, the angular loss as the, in the loss function, and we see that the prediction is really good, and also the validation uh, loss, which is the blue line in the plot on the left, is also uh, showing small values. Which and so we saw that the angular loss was actually a good um, value to take, in, uh, to take in account for the loss function, but then we wanted actually to do what we said, so I include the DRMSD. Uh, we went over and do that. So at first, we combined the two, um, the two measures, and the way we did that was to um, normalize both um, measures and then uh, took, uh, like weighting them, we took off 60% uh, for the angular loss and 40% for the DRMSD. And uh, what what we saw from the from the graphs, like on the on the right graph, you can see the Ramachandran plot. 
and there the um, the predicted angles are are not that good. They strive away a little bit from the the actual values. But on the left, you can see that the validation loss value is actually not that bad. And then we went over for the second approach, which was using both the RMSD and the Angular loss. One minute. Loss just switching from one to the other after a certain threshold was crossed and the threshold was about the number of steps that we were we were taking in the in computing in training the model and and that's basically it for the for the results and then as a future perspective we said we could use the PSSM to identify similar sequences to use as initial angles for the model or creating a model itself off with a loss function to put severe weights to the angles and validating these the weights for the RMSD and then we could also thought about incorporating the mask information to select similar motifs in the, in, in the similar sequences. Um, so yeah, that's it and thank you for your attention. And as a last note, I wanted to share the, the, the problem that we actually managed to compute. So the, um, and let me just share it. Okay, so that's, that's the, our results for the, for the um, uh, COVID uh, problem. So yeah. Great. Uh, Jeppe, do you have a question? Cool. Yeah, very cool and nice picture. And then you have the protein. Uh, obviously, you thought a lot about whether to use uh, angular loss or DMSD. Typically, mm -hmm. angular loss tends to favor sort of local local passive features of, of the protein, and, and MSD tends to favor global features of the proteins. Uh, obviously, the reason why we're doing this is so we can quickly develop vaccines and, and similar things. Have you thought about which one of these two measures actually makes the most sense, biologically speaking? Um... Uh, well, um, if uh, well, if we think about if we think about drugs, for example, we know that um, for a drug to work, it to, should um, be able to um, uh, find the right place to uh, to situate itself in the in the protein in the in the virus. So maybe in that sense, we would uh, consider um, the DRMSD better or. So maybe maybe the DRMSD in the long run could help more. Uh, I don't know. That would be my question. That would be my answer. Cool. Yeah, makes sense. Okay. Thank you so much for this discussion. And now we're moving forward. And uh, the next session gonna be a presentation from the challenge of DNA art. Uh, last, are you ready? Okay. Good. Uh, so the first, next presenting team, please share your screen. Is the team Gensware. Please prepare team two master students. Uh, team Gensler? I think it's really nice uh, joint that the last uh, picture we had from the team proteins for the artistic-ish representation of a protein because it's really nice and links us to DNA art. Team Gensler, can you share your screen? Are you with us? Hello. Good morning or good afternoon. Hey. Uh, Okay, great. We can see your screen. Are you ready to start the presentation? Uh, yes, I am. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I've been corrected. Uh, team the proteins. Have you presented? Oh, uh, am I not going right now? Uh, maybe I, I'm mistaken. I think because I think uh, I we're in the, the art group. Uh, yes, yes uh, team, there is team one more proteins. From yeah, I'm Here. sorry for that. I just uh, missed my records. I'm sorry for that. Okay, I'm so sorry for this thing. No, uh, then stop team, no team Gensware, you are the next. And okay. then Team Proteins are presenting right now, and you should have just screamed at me because I made a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Make, and uh, as the same mistake once again, please, the team, uh, just scream at me. Uh, so yeah, um, yep, uh, you're still here. Good. Uh, one last presenter from the Protein Regime. I'm so sorry for this confusion. Uh, team Proteins, can you share your screen? Uh, yes. Uh, wait a second. Uh, can you see it? Can you see we my can screen? see a paper. We can see a paper from plus one. Is that what we're supposed to see? Uh, mm, no. Uh, Log, that's... no uh, uh, Word, Microsoft document right now? Yes, yes, that's it. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't make a beautiful All right. you ready to start? PowerPoint uh, presentation. So um, actually, uh, we have uh, an idea of using a Skipgram network. So the idea is uh, how Skipgram works is that um, it's used for natural language processing and we think this approach might uh, work for biological sequences too. So uh, let's say we have our uh, sequence 
of um, letters and uh, we uh, select um, let's say three letter uh, reference point and we move a window uh, around that uh, three letters uh, block as the window itself is a three letter block for itself too and this uh, network can find uh, relationship uh, b uh, between those uh, three grams so uh, by, by by finding this uh, by finding this link uh, between the sequences, uh, we can uh, make some uh, better uh, prediction model and uh, we can leverage uh, better feature extraction. So that's mainly our idea. Uh, we tried to make some implementation, but we did not uh, succeeded it and uh, we had a quite big big overfitting error uh, so uh, unfortunately we uh, has not uh, have not been able to fold the uh, final um, coronavirus protein but yes yeah, that's our idea that's it and we also had to put some links so uh, you can have a better understanding of how uh, skip ram network works thanks for sharing your learning experience anyways with us uh Jeppe, you want to ask a question uh sure uh yeah so great idea about sort of uh, using uh, nearby amino acids in in the embedding of each amino acid uh i'm curious if you thought about sort of other ways you could do this uh, specifically uh things like gans right now are quite popular and sort of uh, calculating a local, local representation representation of each amino acid uh, but you could also have used say an lsgm or something like that just to incorp uh, incorporate nearby information i'm curious if you sort of al along those lines um not really no okay cool uh yeah but otherwise uh looks promising yep okay thank you so much for this nice and concise presentation Thank you again, Team Proteins and Team Gensware for handling this uh, messy situation. And now this time for real, Team Gensware is presenting. We are moving to the DNA art and Lasse, for the second time, I'm inviting you uh, to join. Now we can see your presentation, Team Gensware. Are you ready to start? Uh, yes, I am. Go ahead. Oh, hey, uh, so good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we are Team Gensware, uh, made up of Jonathan, Rob, Winfield, Winston, and uh, Frederick. So uh, uh, the title of our talk is Code of Arms Arc Created by SNP Seeded uh, Generative Adversarial Network. Uh, the whole goal of this was to essentially use um, genomic data in order to help seed a generative adversarial network to create a piece of art. Now for our art, we decided that we would try uh, linking uh, genomics, uh, which of course uh, inheritance, to something like uh, coat of arms or uh, heraldry. So in order to use a generative adversarial network, uh, we started off with a DNA seed uh, from a 23andMe genotype um, uh, file. Uh, and from that, we essentially used an algorithm to create a singular numeric seed to feed into uh, a generator. Uh, now, for the way that a GAN works is you have a real image library and a generator. Uh, they both pass images to a discriminator. Uh, the discriminator will then attempt to figure out which one is true and which one is essentially a generated one. Uh, you can see here we have a generated loss and we have a uh, discriminator loss. So this one is potentially the one that would kind of move on and be a successful one we'd create. Uh, now, we have a website you can go to uh, so our goal was that we wanted to have a website you can move to, throw some 23andMe data into it uh, based on uh, the SNP uh, genotypes uh, and generate a completely unique coat of arms based on the seed created from that genotype uh, and then running it through the GAN. Uh, you can actually go to that link right now and try some of our example 23andMe data sets there. Um, let's go to it right now actually and give it a quick try. So, drum roll. Uh, 
unfortunately, like this is after hours and hours of training the GAN network, it's still not perfect. <laughs> uh, we do anticipate that if we let this continuously run for more hours and uh, help the training model a little more, uh, we will get an actual coat of arms forming. At the moment, you just kind of see the beginnings of it. Uh, any, uh, there will also be a unique coat of arms generated to the particular uh, 23B file you put in. So if you just put the same file in, you'll get the exact same thing out again, because that is that particular unique one for it. Uh, we also created a, a little bit of a poem here um, based upon the exact same seed. So that will be unique to that 23andMe data as well. Uh, let's go back to the presentation then. Uh, you have one minute left. Future expansions we want to go for is to uh, expand this into, say, Japanese come-ons or family Latin mottos, uh, totem poles, even perhaps other forms of heraldry we can use. Um, we'd also like to utilize the 23andMe uh, ethnic pieces of SNPs to generate coat of arms uh, essentially based on the composition of your genetics. Uh, so that would be basically grabbing uh, heraldry from different regions and creating a uh, something that to go along, along with your genetic makeup for your heraldry. Uh, we'd like to thank you very much for your time. Uh, we really appreciate the project. We had a great time doing it. And uh, I, I hope you can go to our website and try it out. I'll, I'll put the link in the chat for you, okay? Right. Great, thank you for the presentation. Lasse, your time for a question? Yes, first a little sound check. Am I okay? You're good, yes. go ahead. Oh, good. That's great. I, I put in my na own name uh, while you were presenting. Uh, I'm. I'm <laughs> <laughs> it looks like a medieval knight on LSD or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I'm obviously, I'm super happy with it. Uh, I have only one question. How in the world did you come up with this idea? Uh, <laughs> well, as mentioned, we were trying to think, uh, we wanted to capture people's attention. And people using 23andMe, often they're interested in their own heritage and background. And what screams more about one's heritage than uh, heraldry created in it? So we thought that it would be fascinating to combine your genetics into actual symbolism that goes down. Uh, like I, I think I think it's great. I think you should patent this and sell this. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we we'd love to keep this going. Actually, do you know how long uh, the uh, Amazon server you have us working on stays good for? No, I have to say, uh, close it down Maybe you afterwards. Can... But but let's take the details later. Yeah, I think we're finished. Yeah, yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Yes, great thank time. you so much, and it's really good, guys. You are having <laughs> these discussions now. That's really great. I love it. But we have to go further down. The list and the next presenting is team two master students team two master students are you ready please prepare team placeholder yeah we can hear you but we cannot see a screen yet and now we are about to see. Uh, all right we can see you are you ready to start yep good go ahead so uh, I'm uh, Alison Bonnemo uh, from uh, Team uh, Two Master Students, uh, which is from uh, of, uh, Morgan Choke and me. Uh, we came from uh, North uh, France, and we are studying uh, biology and bioinformatics. So uh, our, um, our aim was to find a nice way to represent uh, DNA, and especially one that can be uh, uh, unique to each, uh, each, each person. Uh, so uh, we try to uh, map DNA um, as a, to use DNA as a map, um, uh, as a map generating tool, uh, because we, uh, we also, uh, we, we, uh, to, as an, as an example to, uh, to, um, to represent uh, the world that is, that, that we all uh, bear in us. So uh, we don't use uh, obviously all, the whole DNA. We use the, the dataset uh, uh, of uh, 23andMe um, data, uh, and uh, we looked at each lossy uh, of uh, each SNP, and we looked if it was uh, hetero or homozygote. Uh, with this, we can uh, create a 2D map uh, with black and white uh, uh, dots, each one representing. Uh, uh, a category of uh, SRO or homozygosity, mm -hmm. and then we uh, smooth uh, all of this with perlin uh, with a perlin nose, and then we colorize it uh, based on the on the uh, on the height uh, found with the, this uh, this approach. 
so here you can see that uh, we can uh, create a map for each chromosome and uh, we have two uh, different way of uh, representing it. Uh, one, we, we, with that with it, we can create islands and uh, with the other we can create uh, land masses. Uh, it is not completely uh, uh, finished this one, but we try to create a, a good landscape version. Uh, and uh, you can see that it is unique for each person, obviously, because we don't have uh, the same pattern of uh, um, hetero or homozygosy for each uh, overall uh, So what do we want to, to do to improve it? Uh, first of all, we want to create a, a 3D map based on this, uh, with unity. Uh, create a giant mass of, uh, with all, all, all chromosomes in one map. Uh, generate a close random smooth shapes uh, form or, or noise. So to create uh, maybe like a circle or a star that has uh, many um, uh, many uh, uh, vertices, uh, which with each vertices uh, size uh, based on the, something that you can see on the on the map. Or uh, maybe the, a way of determining land mass and uh, automatic uh, determination of, uh, of region, and then name the left. left. So you can, uh, we would, we wanted to have uh, some island named uh, randomly based off uh, some other data that we can find uh, on the DNA or something, something else. So um, I guess that's it. Uh, thank you for your attention, and uh, we were we really enjoyed uh, looking on the working on this project. Thank you. Well, thank you. It looks very good. I have one question is, uh, have you considered if you can implement such that you can set, connect these maps to, um, to strategy games? I'm thinking civilization uh, and games like that. I think that could be very useful to have personalized yeah. genetic maps that you can play on. Uh, at first, it came from the, the fact that you, you say that nobody wanted to make uh, uh, Minecraft uh, maps from, uh, from this data. But yeah, the, the, the principal idea of this was uh, uh, the, last, the last one that we, that we, that we told, uh, really the naming of regions, and then uh, maybe you can play with it along, uh, but uh, we did not have time to, to implement that one. But I, yes, think it's, it was, uh, I think it's a great idea. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for this Mind Minecraft uh, presentation. And now we're going further down the list. Uh, and next team presenting is a team placeholder. Please start sharing your screen. Please prepare team genome, genome gnomes. Yes. Hi. Uh, Hi, Teodoro. We can see your screen and hear you. Yes. Let me just make this small. OK. So you ready to start? Uh, yes. So we are a team uh, placeholder, and uh, we are uh, formed from Nuda Pong and myself, and we are two master's students at Copenhagen University in uh, bioinformatics. Uh, so the goal of this challenge was uh, to use a GAN architecture to produce a personalized picture based on a person's DNA sequence, and more specifically, their SNPs. So it's important to mention that because of this, we had two steps, basically. The first one was encoding the DNA from one person, and the second one was to also get some real pictures uh, to train the gun. So the DNA encoding, what we thought of was uh, using uh, the counts of each, uh, of each type of SNP, of SNP, so, uh, for example, for chromosome one, there were five uh, AA SNPs. Um, the GAN architecture, we used TensorFlow, and we created, uh, we used their uh, original deep convolutional GAN, uh, to which uh, we put the DNA encoding into the generator to create a, a fake image. We trained with fake and real pictures, the discriminator using the real abstract pictures. And uh, then we calculated a loss that was between the correctly labeled fake pixels and the fake images similar to the real one. Um, and this is the results 
that we obtain. Uh, these three uh, are from three different people. And even though it's not the traditional abstract uh, picture, we think that it could make at least a cool uh, screen wallpaper for your phone. Um, and as you can see, the three pictures are uh, not that different in between uh, different people. So we thought that maybe our counting uh, of SNP is not ideal as the, uh, the data might not be different enough to generate completely different data for each person. So we thought of doing a different type of DNA encoding, maybe something like DNA to vector um, that could generate very different pictures for every single person. And um, the other perspective that we had was to incorporate user feedback into the image generation process, basically to add another classif uh, classifier layer that One minute, would, says. Yep, that would fine tune our GAN by forcing it to create a certain type of image that is liked by the user. And that would be done by basically adding another type of loss. And this is it from us. Thank you. That sounded very cool. I think you are so far the ones that have stuck the most to the uh, to the, the, the outline task, but that's okay because, as I said, everything goes. Uh, this is the start. Um, as for questions, um, and I wanted to ask: like, is this easily implementable on the server, or did you run it local? Because if I'm interested to use it uh, further. Well, the DNA encoding it was run on the server, and yeah. I I have to ask my colleague. My yeah. colleague has to uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, the also the GAN the GAN also was implemented to be able to run on the common line server. So yes, I put the it's just like you just run it on the command line. You you I I, I write the code in the way that you can just use the command line to run everything. Okay, thank you. That's very interesting. And thank you both. Thank you so much for the presentation. And then we are going uh, further down the list. The next team presenting is the team Genome Gnomes. Please share your screen. Please pre get ready for the, uh, please prepare team Deep DNA Art. Deep DNA Art. Can you guys uh, see me? We can see your screen. We can hear you really well. Are you ready to start? Yep, ready to start. Um, hey there, my name is uh, Brooks Henry. I'm representing Team Genome Gnomes made up of myself and Drew. Uh, we're master's students in cancer biology at the German Cancer Research Center in partnership with Heidelberg University. Um, so I'll skip, I'll skip over this uh, slide about SNPs. I think everybody here is familiar with that. Um, so in our approach, we drew inspiration um, in two kind of opposite ends of the art spectrum. Um, our first inspiration is this contemporary artist named Damien Hirst, um, who's really famous for these kind of massive dot paintings that are composed of hundreds of thousands of dots. Um, but we also drew inspiration from the artistic movement known as pointillism, which is uh, composing images using tons of tiny little dots of solid colors. Um, so with that in mind, um, and working with SNP data from 23andMe, uh, we took the raw SNP data files um, and then parsed them and concatenated them together um, into an array. Um, and then we hashed this into numerical values and used this to generate RGB values, um, which then generated these unique pixel images. So for every person, uh, there'll be a unique image. Um, and then we fed this into Google's DeepDream um, convolutional neural network. Um, so we didn't use a GAN, we used a CNN. Um, so just a little preface for those of you who aren't familiar with Google's Deep Dream. Um, it's a computer vision program. Um, it was originally trained to find uh, and enhance patterns in certain images. Um, so here, for example, you start with an image of a jellyfish um, and the, the network is trained to find images of dogs. And so slowly, if you do enough iterations, it starts finding dogs in the image. Um, for our implementation, ours was pre-trained on ImageNet. Um, and using the Inception V3 model. So for example, here's uh, an example of kind of one of our starting images. Um, and then uh, after one iteration, you can start to see patterns coming out 
Um, after five, the patterns start to become really apparent. Um, 10, they become even more apparent. Uh, 25 is when we hoped we would start seeing some more um, uh, faces or animal images or something. Um, so we bumped it up to 50 iterations and there seems to be um, uh, diminishing returns after about 25 or 30, depending on how you exactly set the settings on the Deep Dream. Um, so here's some examples, uh, some screenshots. The, the detail really only comes out if you kind of zoom in on the images. If you, if you just have it uh, kind of an overview of the image, they all look relatively similar, but there are, uh, every picture is unique and there are lots of uh, details in them. Um, and playing around with the settings, uh, you can kind of achieve different effects, um, but not being a, uh, a guy who's very familiar with these sorts of things, I wasn't quite sure what I should uh, play around with it, um, you know, to kind of figure One it minute. out. Thanks. Um, but yeah, so uh, Deep Dream is also available as a, um, uh, a web application. Um, and that one tends to work quite a bit better. So this is an example of one of our images that we fed into um, the, the web application um, and running it through several iterations. Um, and you start to see faces come out. And I, I think this really encapsulates what we were trying to go for um, with you know, turning your, this SNP data that's unique to you into the whole picture of a whole person. Um, yeah, but that is, uh, that is, that is my presentation. Uh, thank you guys. Thank you very much. That was a very interesting uh, solution. I have one question. How, how, can, how do you think um, it can go from a blue image of a jellyfish to something really showing dogs, but not from random colors? What, what, can you speak yeah. on that? So I, I suspect, um, and again, I'm not super familiar with this stuff, but I, I, I suspect that uh, the images actually need to be a bit more complex in a certain sense for, for Deep Dream to like set seeds to, to start beginning to find patterns. Um, when you have a, an image that looks like just lots of colored dots, I think the, that the program really struggles to derive image, like, you know, faces and stuff out of that right away. Um, it takes mm. quite a few iterations, mm. um, but I, I'm not sure. <laughs> Thank you anyway, very nice presentation. Thanks. Thank you a lot for your presentation and thank you for staying on time. Uh, you can close your sharing now and team Deep DNR, please start sharing your screen. And the next team preparing is team Genage Mutant Ninja Taxis. Hi there. Can you see my screen? We can see your screen, we can hear you. Are you ready to go? Yes, perfect. Okay, go good. We are team DNA Art and um, we want to make deep, uh, we want to make art with deep neural networks. Um, our team consists of Simona, myself, Valentine, uh, and Christina, and we are spread out over Italy, Copenhagen, uh, as well as Canada. Um, so let's dive into it. So we humans, we are fascinated by a lot of things and we like to look at pretty stuff. So for example, you can look at these karyotypes, which are images, representations of um, labeled chromosomes. But also we like a lot to look at art and be fascinated by its complexity and whatever we can see in it. So this challenge challenged us to combine, combine these kind of things and really create art based on um, our genome. So this is what we did. And as the challenge um, suggests that we use generative adversarial networks. And these are kind of like a thief and a cop two kind of networks that are trying to outsmart each other. So the cop is trying, the discriminator is trying to um, see which of the fake images the thief or the generator network created um, and tries to distinguish them from the actual training set images that we gave the, the network to train on. Um, so the idea is that the generator network will create images that are as similar as possible to the training set. So how did that? How did we set that up? Well, we gave it a training set with images from landscapes, from WikiArt, about 3000, um, for the generator network um, to kind of take inspiration from. And this random noise that the network takes as an input, we would use DNA data for that. Um, to generate these images, the fake images, which we're interested in um, for the users uh, to actually create art out of their DNA. So what do we unravel from these DNA sequences? Well, we're interested in these SNPs, 
the single positions that have mutations. So we looked into the raw files that we were given and we just we um, tried to figure out which of these locations are heterozygous. So if you have this chromosome pair, for which of the pairs do the chromosomes differ in these single locations in the, in the base pair they have? So these would mark with a one uh, for about 10,000 SNP positions per chromosome for each of the chromosomes. And then we would consolidate consolidate this because this is very sparse. Only about 5% of all these SNP positions that were measured actually contained heterozygous um, bases. So taking 25 together would result in one uh, binary. Um, and with this, we would have 400 binaries per chromosome, which would then feed into the generator network to use as a starting point to create these images of. So, and then what you do is a lot of hyperparameter tuning, a lot of training, a lot more training. And you see that in the beginning, there's almost nothing. And then actually you kind of get into the direction of something where you're like, ah, this looks pretty fascinating. So this is definitely what you want. So One get your left. most personal art piece now, get your carrier spectrum, put it in a nice place at your home. Some people have like paintings from Monet or from Andy Warhol, um, you definitely want to have a carrier spectrum in your home. Thank you very much and please get in touch with us. This was the presentation by Deep DNA Art. Thank you all. This was a really amazing and very great. I have a, I have a completely different question. Uh, are you guys aware that uh, Donald Trump is tweeting about your project uh, personally? It's something I found uh, online under the hashtag. <laughs> what? <laughs> Uh, maybe it's just a profile, uh, but if you if you um, a fake Donald Trump profile, but uh, if you follow the there's somebody called Best Donald Trump going specifically for your uh, uh, your presentation. Maybe you should share your screen, Lasse. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I will put it in the channel. I was okay. I was, just, I was really confused because uh, if if this was something about it, uh, but. Uh, Anyway, I loved your presentation. It, it will not detract from it that Donald Trump is uh, is tweeting <laughs> about it. It will also not, it will also not gain for it. <laughs> nice, but we had a lot of fun. Thanks for posing us this challenge and helping us out. <laughs> okay, that's some fun and expected publicity we're getting there. Uh, so we we'll keep going with our schedule, and the next team presenting is Gene H Mutant Ninja Taxis. Uh, can you guys start sharing your screen? And I believe oh, I have wait, run out. Wait, sorry for interrupting. Am I? Maybe I'm. I I was too fast. I think this Don't is. Don't need the to interrupt. Interest. I I've got this. You got this. Thanks. I shut up. Okay. So hi everyone. So uh, can I just before we continue with your presentation? I think we are done with all the teams. Is there anybody else who is on a team who hasn't presented and think that I forgot them? Go on once, go on okay. twice, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so hi, we are from the Genage Mutant Ninja Taxis team and we're very, very happy to unveil our secret project, which somehow got spoiled in just a few moments ago. <laughs> so we pre pre present the Presidential Precision Medicine Service because you have all been fired. All bioinformaticians have been fired by Donald Trump. So now we have this great, tremendous new service where you can insert your DNA and get Donald Trump's personal feedback and opinion on it. So let's just do this. Let's just enter um, a random DNA sequence. Wait, wait, wait. Keyboard. So, random DNA sequence, and let's see what Donald Trump has to say about it. Oh, here's a tweet. So, it's responding to something, and all the real last night at 10 p.m. on Real Hellier to mention state of the truth. And he was really bad and watching a people are the failing trade, and the secret policy is the solution in the new 150 times in the polls of me with March Miss. So, this is a very great insight of his 
Donald Trump truly. And if you don't understand this tweet, well, maybe you should study something else. But the best thing about our new project is that you can actually tweet this thing to our personal project account, which has recently been unveiled. And Twitter is failing us. Why are you doing this, Twitter? I am very much um, not in favor of this development. So let's try this again. Okay, we still have a backup plan. Backup DNA goes here. And now I know I have some H's in there, but Trump can also deal with H's. So, retweet. Okay, Twitter. I am going to fire the CEO of Twitter because he's not tweeting our stuff. But anyway, what we have here is the fulfillment of the dream of every bioinformatician. A newer network that is strained with the statements from the, one of the most prominent minds of our time to make sense of your DNA. So if you want to use the service, you can use this um, QR code or use this URL. I will give you five seconds to just visit the website until I pre proceed with the presentation. And while we have a pause, I say that you have one minute left. Okay, so how did we actually accomplish this great feat? So we were setting out to start with GANs to generate Trump tweets. The problem is that GANs are not that well suited for uh, generating text because GANs produce continuous values, whereas text is discrete values. So eventually we found a network provided by uh, Kapafi called ChaRNN on GitHub. And this network was originally designed to produce Shakespeare quotes based on original Shakespeare data. Um, however, our project, of course, takes DNA and produces Trump quotes. And you see, we still get realistic Trump quotes out of your DNA. Our data sources were from Wikiquote, from Twitter, and from a CNN article about Donald Trump's wildest lines of 2019. And we have data from basically all of Trump's life until today. 10 seconds left. Okay, so what are the future perspectives? If Trump gets re-elected, then we will train the model with more data to make it even greater. So, thank you very much, my fellow M Americans. Read my tweets. <laughs> that yes. was very funny, and it explains so much to me because I was so confused about all this Trump involvement. Um, I, I could also see in the servers that there was one of them that had folders called Trump but I didn't know who took what server. So uh, my question is, is this running actually from one of the TPU instances directly? Yes, you see, <laughs> it's here. So it will shut down if you shut down the server. So don't shut down the server. I, I won't shut down. We will talk about that in the channel later, but it, it's, it's very amazing you got it to run. Uh, you completely reformed the server, I can see, with Donald Trump. Um, no, no comments on that, that's, that's great. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it seems that, yeah, Twitter itself, I know, may, no. maybe they've suspended our account. Maybe that's it. Mm -hmm. Don't, don't worry about that. Well, that's a good point to figure out, but thank you so much for the presentation, for the questions. And I believe we are done with our session. So I'll tell you what's going to happen next.